Noah is an artist, an activist, and arts teacher based in New York, using sculpture, writing, performance, direct action to shed light on social and economic injustice and inspire change. When Occupy Wall Street uh, protest was initiated, he joined as a performance artist and organizer, initiating large-scale protests on the New York subways and a group focused on economic inequality in the arts, Occupy Museums, which participated as well in the seventh Berlin Biennale. And now, in these three sentences, already, you know, the themes and, uh, let's say, the topics and the videos we're going to see in the next, like, 20, 25 minutes are being named, uh, especially your action at the Berlin Biennale, which we will see last. But maybe, if that's okay, Noah, we start out with one of the first actions you did in that movement, which was occupy subways. So, I think we jump right in. Falk, please. Good evening, my friends. My name is George Washington, the father of the country. And I am very, very upset about the direction that the United States of America is taking. Our country is off track. It's deeply off track because all the wealth in the country is only going in one direction, up. And the people don't have jobs, don't have health care. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, so how did that action come about? Why choose the subway? Yes, and uh, what is the significance in, 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 in the broader sense, in the sense of a public space we all share? Maybe we start at that point. Okay, well, first thank you for inviting me, or for allowing me to invite myself to the yeah, conference. Well, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> and so, I'm, I mean, this is probably obvious, but I'm not speaking for Occupy Wall Street. I'm not speaking for Occupy Museums. Um, you know, I had sort of my own experience in, this mom in the moment, uh, and I went, that's what I want to share. An experience that was transform it is still transformative for me and has totally reoriented reori my life and actually brought me here. And um, so, as everybody knows this, because it went on uh, international press, but some, there, was something, there was something sparked um, that allowed everyone to meet up in Zuccotti Park in New York. And what we did was, it was, it was not a social, it was not a protest. It was a space to create a new culture. And in the U.S., we lost the word public. We, lo we lost all the language around what public means uh, in a specific way that through you know, advertising and a you know, uh, different kind of identity of consumer. And in Zuccotti Park, we were making our own culture in a very naive way, effectively naive way of just basically speaking with each other and in opening a space of inclusion where anybody from the city, which is a very diverse city, could walk in. And this was amazing. And then very quickly it came under threat as it, as it uh, presented a problem from, like, for example, Mayor Bloomberg. And Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg tried to evict the park many times. The first time he tried to evict the park, he was unsuccessful because we got the unions and we got a whole bunch of people to join us. And it would have been a bad media story to evict the park at that moment, which was a high moment for the movement. But we saw how fragile the whole thing was. That we can't be in one park. We have to be everywhere. So Occupy Subways, like New York City has five or six million people moving through the subway system every day. 
And so it's a, and, and the subways is an incredibly diverse space because most spaces are not very diverse. They're self segregated. But the subways is just everybody. And we thought, if, in this revolutionary moment, because we really thought, you know, this is the revolutionary moment, we need to infect the subway system with our interest in inclusion and breaking down the barriers that, like, take public space and turn it into private space. So what you see here was kind of a clunky early one, but eventually we, got, we had groups that were going all over the subway system and trying to spark conversations to turn subways into forums for people to talk to each other and just learn what it's like to talk to strangers about what you're thinking about. Thank you very much. Um, moving to creating public space. <clears throat> now, now the, of course, the subway is not a luxury environment, but you move to, let's say, creating public space in a luxury environment, which uh, in this case, uh, we will see an example, was the MoMA, yes? And I think this is even being said, if I remember correctly, uh, in, in, the, in the video, yes? That this plays a big role. The impossibility for the 99%, so to speak, to enter as one and also to exhibit. So maybe before we go into this, uh, Falk, would you be so nice to show the action in the MoMA in New York? percent in regard to the arts I mean they're no different it's the same so I think that you know the thing was called Occupy Wall Street so it's Occupy Wall Street which means banks right which means financial center of financial financial power but it, it quickly became clear that I think it was clear to everyone that we're not targeting banks as the only problem. That, again, um, we have a problem of the word public, and it's also a problem in our culture. And I would say, in some way, it's a challenge to corporate culture, to, to uh, what we think culture is. Because culture is always sort of a battleground. Even if you don't know it, it's a battleground. Even if you think it doesn't look like political art, it's definitely political art. Um, so museums, I think, so we, that's why I thought to take the protest from Wall Street to museums, not leaving Wall Street. I mean, there's plenty of people still in Wall Street. But um, museums are the factories in which symbols of authority uh, and uh, value are made. So if you see a museum, and even Diego Rivera, who... You saw those images of Diego Rivera, who's an artist, a Mexican mural artist from the mid-20th century, who's a very politicized left-wing figure. Even someone like that, in our times, can be brought into MoMA, and nobody knows any of this history. He's just a commodity. 
because this is this is this pro- a process of co-option and reconfiguration of symbols. So, um, so art is actually a place, a battleground. And right now, art. A lot of people, if you think about art, you may think of luxury, like Damien Hirst or you know the one percent in all our respective countries collecting art. And there's all these biennials and this whole like exclusive world of art. That's just what art looks like now from the top down as it's dispersed through our media, but that, that's not what it has to be. So we went to MoMA and we thought the best thing to do is just use the museum as, again, um, an experimental laboratory to start a new culture, which means having discussions, talking to each other, using the space differently, so that's what you see here. And I like the way uh, how you, you know, which strategy you use to go in the in the museum and my feeling is and you know i would be curious if that's uh, if, if that's correct that it feels very inaggressive in the sense you know it makes a statement but but uh, it's not aggressive and i thought the way the um the security personnel is behaving there yes it seems like they didn't interfere or am i wrong It depends. I mean, there's ac- some, there are people that were arrested at some of our actions, but we realized that, um, that it's impossible to arrest us inside the museum. I mean, you think somehow the museum is the fortress and you can't go inside, but then you realize, actually, you can definitely go inside. You just go inside as citizens. And then when you're inside, you start doing things, like having a big forum and chanting, and they can't arrest you because a lot of us are artists, And the show that they're showing is Diego Rivera. So if they arrest you, then you, you have a whole thing to tell the press about how they're showing Diego Rivera and arresting activists. So there, anyway, so a lot of what we're doing in Occupy Wall Street is um, finding these potential spaces, which are everywhere. I mean, there's all kinds of experimentations you can do. And we find these spaces, kind of use them, push them to another level. Yeah, and I think this not only happened in New York, But uh, you moved as well to uh, Berlin, um, not I mean physically, of course, yes. But uh, at the last Biennale, maybe some of you here uh, uh, saw that or witnessed it or read about it. Uh, some action happened in the Pergamon Museum, and of course, uh, I mean, there's the question of appropriation of of foreign art that's being exhibited uh, in, in a German museum. And uh, I think when we see the next, uh, the next uh, short clip, uh, which Biennale produced, thankfully, um, I think you refined the technique, and I would, I would really love if you can expand after we saw it uh, on this as well, be thought, because it felt to me it got even a more performative touch without, you know, trying to be art, the action itself, yes. But it's really, really clever, and you will see in a second. Be so kind. When righteousness withers away. When righteousness withers away. 
And evil rules the land. And evil rules the land. We come into being. We come into being. Age after age. Age after age. Take visible shape. Take visible shape. And move. And move. People among people. People among people. Thrusting back evil. Thrusting back evil. And putting virtue. And putting virtue. On her seat again. On her seat again. Maybe note, uh, and we spoke about this before, how the security personnel is still living in the pre-digital age, thinking if you put a hand in front of a camera, you will uh, you know, avoid uh, uh, handies to, to film this action. Um, well, interesting little detail, maybe. Um, so, did you have, I mean, doing this in Germany, well, let's say this, this form of protest in the museums uh, was, you know, till then rather, rather uncommon, yes. Uh, what was your experience right after this uh, uh, action? And connecting to that maybe the question of effect. Um, because there were a lot of actions you did, um, and I think the base question for the activist, of course, is does his activity, besides changing the people who do it, also, do they change the environment? Well, right after this action, the, uh, uh, German poli the police tried to detain us, but we, they didn't have any grounds to detain us because it's a cultural action. So that's a way that... I mean, so, our, I mean, so we're making culture, and they, it's a word game. It's all about words and symbols because... The, the police wanted us to say that it was a protest. They said, are you protesting? And we said, we're, ma we're making culture. And they don't know what to do with that. And it's true, we're make, I, I believe we're making culture, but it, there, it, this is a letter of the law. You have to say, I'm against. Is this working? Yeah. So anyway, so that didn't work, but we had an interesting discussion. Is it, does it have an effect? I mean, that's a, uh, I think that... that we need to, it's necessary to change the language in this and reconfigure the symbols in order to change other things. That's, or let, let's say parallel to. And, I mean, art is full of symbols. Symbol, like, I, think it's a, I think museums are factories for symbols. And the Pergamon Museum in Berlin is a perfect example, right? So there's actually an altar, which is from Pergamon in Turkey, in Berlin, And that has a particular history, and that is, if tourists come to Berlin, that's what they see in a museum. So they think, this is Berlin, right? And that's a particular history of Berlin. And the fact is, museums and many institutions come from the 19th century, which is the era of colonization and of bureaucratization around that idea. So um, in the U.S., museums... Uh, emerge simultaneous, for example, with the extermination, near extermination of American Indian tribes. So they, you know, they killed off a lot of Native Americans all over the U.S., and then there was a process to uh, detribalize people and turn them into American citizens, which means individuals uh, disconnected from a culture. And at the same time, they took their artifacts and put them in museums so you could understand what once was. And, I mean, then there's, there's a history in Germany they're, you know, going to do the same thing in the Second World War with the cultures they were trying to take away. So if you understand that um, 
DNA that's in museums, then you really want to go and work with the museum and see what's possible to, you know, mess around with the authority that's invisible around the museum. Yeah, and of course, you know... Ah, Geraldine, please, sorry. Is it okay? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, um, in, in, the, in the UK, in, in London, all national museums are free to enter. And I was just wondering if there was any um, sort of equivalent action to what you were doing there with a different approach because, I mean, of course, the whole colonization issue remains, especially to many of the artifacts contained in these national museums. However, the, you know, the, the, the point that you were making at MoMA, so the restrictiveness of being able to access what is in there and or the, like, you know, why do you have these spaces, that there are spaces for the public to enter and to educate themselves um, is maybe a different one there. So I was just wondering if that, you know, was a part of your discussion or approach. Well, I mean, so I think that there's an overall theme around, actually around this conference, which is how the politics of different regions, which are different politics, can be connected, right? So, because there's different struggles in different countries, and symbols have different meaning too. In the UK, there is another group that's doing some very similar stuff to Occupy Museums. For example, in the Tate Modern, which was a big factory of some sort, they brought a huge turbine propeller in, and they're protesting the relation, I believe the relation between the British government and oil companies. So, they're, so again, using the symbol of museum, of like this is culture and, and this is the cultural authority, using that to play with their relationship with their government. But, um, but I think that the history of colonization in, you know, in Britain is a great reason to occupy a whole bunch of museums there too. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so it's... Um, I just want to say that uh, the Liberate Tate actions, they are against the sponsorship of BP, the oil company, at the Tate. So uh, they did a lot of actions against the Tate, so they will uh, stop their sponsorship deal with BP. And uh, the turbine thing was, um, it was a gift, and because it's a national museum, all gifts need to be taken in and... So they said this turbine thing is, yeah, that was the relation. Okay, just 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 a sec. Maybe Sabina have noted. Uh, we have just saying we have uh, uh, asked for one intervention. So Sabina, Sabina is next, if that's okay, because I asked Alexandra and Igor to give a short statement beforehand, and then Sabina's question, if that's okay. Um, Alexandra, because she has to leave in, in five minutes, um, I wanted to spread this uh, for a moment because we have uh, two guests, Alexandra Sekulic from Belgrade, from the Center of Cultural Decontamination, um, which also deals with, let's say, creating a public space for culture and intervention where there has been no public space, but in a quite different form. So maybe if, if you give us a short insight on this, please. Me, uh, the beginning of your introduction was the crucial one when you said that the whole notion of public is uh, lo uh, uh, withering. <laughs> and uh, you started this with uh, spaces and goods that were public by uh, habit, known uh, in public discourse. Uh, we come from a different, let's say, disposition of uh, property in socialist Yugoslavia. We had public and social property uh, so much in, uh, intersecting our uh, notions of culture and uh, also all other organizations of uh, activity in society. So we are in a process where... Uh, we are trying to uh, stretch this notion of public uh, uh, not only as naming new places public, but also reactivating the memory of public uh, spaces and goods which are being privatized through much more 
let's say, much more obvious and vulgar, severe war process, actually, in Yugoslavia, which was also a nice hiding place for all those uh, changes of public and notions of public good and space. So your intervention in uh, the tube, in the subway, in a while, uh, uh, for, for a while, reminded me of uh, several uh, theatrical uh, uh, and Brechtian uh, strategies of uh, communicating in those uh, spaces uh, this new uh, language of freedom and trying to, to uh, somehow connect this public notion space and this language that is uh, being articulated in various processes around. Uh, we in the center, uh, we are challenged now to also adopt our experience and knowledge in this very demanding uh, process which is coming and uh, we are trying to connect this specific memory we have of different uh, luxury of public and social spaces uh, but also to name uh, spaces, even symbolical places, public, so we could create infrastructure. Public spaces are infrastructure for something new that we are now heading to or trying to articulate. So uh, in Belgrade, uh, I think this situation is a bit, let's say, more inspirational. And uh, if we, for example, now uh, enter our Museum of Contemporary Art, and uh, do a similar action, it will have a completely uh, opposite uh, uh, reaction, not only uh, reaction and reading, but uh, consequence also. We are in a situation that we have to fight for continuity of public institutions. We come from a culture that is public, that was publicly funded completely, and somehow it is related to, it, it was never on market, it wasn't, uh, the same constellation like in the States. But uh, I must agree, uh, for me, this museum piece was so touching, not only because of this uh, very uh, clear message uh, to emancipate the whole uh, history of art, which is very actually short and new. It comes from uh, capitalism. Art is not a notion from those times in uh, Pergamon and Antique, for, <laughs> for example. Uh, for example, uh, I, I saw this uh, occupying also in Berlin and MoMA. Uh, in MoMA, we see Sanja Ivekovic exhibition going on. She's one of those artists that in Yugoslavia brought this message of emancipation and the huge change in uh, 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 conceptual art brought in Yugoslavia when we were able to uh, enable meeting of East and West at the time. Uh, in April meetings. And uh, the, uh, again, Diego Rivera, and, uh, you said about this, uh, you said Alexandra. that it's neutralized. I'm, yeah. I'm finishing. Uh, today, Boris Groys is also in Berlin. He wrote about this uh, process of neutralization and amortization of politics in the museum, in the white box of the museum. Uh, and what you uh, actually performed do, uh, through your Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street mic is actually a very antique uh, tragedy performance uh, echoing, uh, it, was, uh, it was a performance actually of liberating uh, this space by naming it public and that's what we also some kind of uh, are now trying and learning to do. Uh, also, uh, Somehow, uh, I think that Berlin is a great city because it enables uh, actions like this and acknowledges it and, and uh, includes it into public discourse. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And uh, sorry I'm pushing because we still have a rather, uh, you know, interesting program going on. But please, Sabine, put your question. Yeah, my question is rather short. Um, I was just wondering, I think both your actions were very, like, inspiring, also because... Um, what you just said, naming it public, um, which raises awareness because um, museums are something like the high art and also like a very nationalistic, um, uh, a symbolic way to memorize victories, in a way, at least like regarding uh, national museums. I wonder what, like with that action, what you wanted to create, like did you want to 
was it like okay we want to make this place public even though all those symbols are still in there or like what are the things you want to achieve with that like how is it going to continue can the museum still be a place um, even though there is like a long history and tradition of um, collecting uh, colonistic artifacts etc yeah thank you yeah i think that's a good question well i back to something alexandra said which is basically Uh, I think there is a lot of power in the word as spoken publicly through in a certain way. You know, like, that's we had the discussion before about um, when, when we had a, a theater play here and we were saying it's important for actors to be saying the lines of other people. And somehow that's the power of some of these traditions is that, that you do make a, a, a ceremonial thing happens where when... when people who are trained through the ancient wisdoms, the secrets of art, say something publicly, you can open a space. And then, so, and, and I, would, I would talk about opening a space, and I would say, end there, before I can talk about end effects. I mean, because if you open a space, other things become possible. And so, I don't want to, like, destroy museums. I mean, and that's, so this comes then to the, to an understanding, my understanding, my personal understanding of the word occupy, which is interesting, because occupy seems like somehow you want to conquer something. Um, and I don't think, that's not how I understand it. So I understand it as you want to open up the public space within that thing. And it's basically the public space of possibility and discourse. So if we do a ceremony in Pergamon Museum, maybe the museum can be used differently. Yeah, thank you very much, Noah. And I think before we move uh, to a completely different topic uh, with uh, Abdurrahman Barsame and Geraldine, um, maybe I give this last word in the session as we spoke to Igor Stokvisevsky from Kritička Politična, um, maybe for a short intervention uh, in comparison to the situation and to your work in Poland. Uh, yes, thank you um, very much. The uh, situation in Poland is a little bit different. I think we share the differences with other post-communist countries. Um, the difference is that um, we do not have the big level of uh, social participation. So the spirit of individual democracy uh, or people individually acting in order to provide democracy is much more complicated. On the other hand, we have good, developed and well-established uh, social organizations like, uh, like mine. But then the crucial question appears how to combine the dynamics of well-organized institutions and the democratic spirit. And in fact, um, what I wanted to point as a crucial thing uh, now is, uh, is this point, how even in institutions like the one we are sitting in, how to transform this institution into a more democratic institution. And um, I just wanted to address Noah with the total last question, because we... Uh, So the interventions is mo in MoMA and in Pergamon, but in the Biennale it was not the crucial point what you did. The po point was how to, um, how to push uh, the Biennale and cover as the institution towards horizontality. And there was the two-week experiment, how to transform this big cultural institution into a more horizontal institution uh, to somehow prove that it is possible even in the museum or even in the gallery. And, um, and if you could just, in two words, tell us uh, how did it work? Meaning, um, do you think that what should be the direction to fight against institutions on, or rather to, uh, to introduce the democratic participatory Uh, practices and the democratic and participatory spirit in all the institutions we are, we are in. Okay. First, I just want to shout out Michael Levitin is here from New York. He's 
the guy who was publishing Occupy Wall Street Journal. So, big, one of the main voices of the movement. So, but to the question, so right now, um, I'm thinking a lot about the word institution, you know, which is, so a museum is, I said, a factory of symbols, but like uh, here we all have different relationships to institution. And in the Berlin Biennale, we, came, we were invited as a very strange, unique situation. We were invited by the curators who have actually the curators themselves who are precarious workers and are not exactly representing the institution because they're hired for a time. So then already the institution, you realize it's just people moving through. It's a very fluid thing already. And they invited the movements into the space of art. And we realized that we had a big problem as soon as we arrived because we were working, attempting to work on horizontal logic to share, share power and share our voices. And the museum seemed to want to highlight this as culture, yet it was highlighting this inside of a particular frame, even if the frame was invisible. And the frame is not horizontal, it's the frame of the Kunstwerke uh, institution, which has like a pretty vertical structure. So where we arrived to finally, even as we were planning ceremonial public actions, we realized we have to turn back to the institution that we're working with and have a little mini revolution in this institution and try to lever- push our leverage as being invited to horizontalize the institution. So it was a social experiment. And my understanding now of what's possible with institutions is that there's net, like, it's a different way to think. There's networks of people. There's networks of activists who are, you could say some of them are institutions. There's a gradation from institution to not institution. And we're flowing through institutions. Like this one, for example, that's invited us all under its roof. And maybe, maybe some people want to go make their new institution, but maybe some of us can keep flowing through the shells of in, in, inhabiting and hacking the shells of institutions and using the levers of power that are in those institutions to do other things, pretending like we are them for a little while and then moving on. As we, as we leave traces of our co- culture of horizontality in, in them. That's, that, that's kind of what, I don't know if that makes any sense to people, but that's what I'm thinking about. It, it makes complete sense, and I think it's very inspirational. Um, but really, I mean, especially in this place, which is about political and cultural education, yes, I think this, this makes so much sense, uh, specifically, you know, inventing a new form of political education. So thank you very much for sharing with us. Thank you.